Yeah, the bag is important. Yeah. Okay. Hold on to the bag. Is he the second oh, helper? I, I see. I see. Don't miss it. Don't get lost. Are you part of with us now? Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Hi. <laughs> You're pulling the bag for a fake cripple. I'm just saving my energy. <laughs> I'm not trying to be an imposter, but there are times my legs give out, That's and okay. I want to pick the time. Okay. <laughs> Up with Mark Siegel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Bartlett, I'm the Executive Director of the William Way LGBT Community Center, and I'd like to welcome you all today to this special tour of Speaking Out for Equality, the Constitution, Gay Rights, and the Supreme Court here at the National Constitution Center. We're thrilled to be joined by these incredible uh, pioneers of the LGBT movement who were at the very first demonstrations and who have been activists for the 50 years since to make a difference that led to these great accomplishments, including the wonderful decision from the Supreme Court uh, on marriage equality last Friday. So thank you for joining us. I'd like to introduce Randy Wicker, who participated in one of the first annual reminders, 1965. Uh, Paul Kunstler, who participated as a minor. He was the only one who at age 20 became an activist in this movement, and John James, who was also at the first demonstration. And it's a particular honor to introduce John because he's right here uh, in 1965, Mark <laughs> I'd like to thank Mark Siegel and the DMH Fund for co-sponsoring this event, and the National Constitution Center for being wonderful hosts of our work here. This exhibit started out as a completely different exhibit, an exhibit focusing on the activism of the gay community. And we decided as community organizers, we wanted the exhibit to be here at the National Constitution Center to give it the gravitas that's given by a national museum that focuses on constitutional issues. And we reframed the exhibit, we kept the activist portion, and then we looked at the constitutional history, starting with very early cases that were brought uh, by one, an early gay liberation magazine, and moving through a number of cases that brought us to the point where last Friday we succeeded in achieving marriage equality for the entire United States. Uh, Evan Wolfson's here today uh, from Freedom to Marry. We're really pleased to have him here with us. And we also have wonderful historians with us today. Lillian Faderman, a very early historian of the movement, and I encourage you to see her new book, which is now available on Amazon.com and will be coming out in September. Uh, and that itself is a history of the LGBT rights movement, very powerful, building on over 150 interviews with activists and organizers and academics, so it's definitely a book to check out in September. David Carter, whose book on Stonewall is considered one of the greatest books, focusing on that preeminent moment in our history in 1969, building out of the homophile movement. Uh, and Evan Wilson will also be speaking later today. So we encourage you to join us at a panel at 12.30 up in the main auditorium to hear their thoughts about how from a very small movement of 40 courageous lesbians and gay men in front of Independence Hall that we now have millions of people fighting for LGBT equality and succeeding so effectively. So we're just about to walk into the exhibit. I'm going to take you on a chronological tour starting from those early days in the 50s when homosexuality was viewed as a disease, when we were viewed as outsiders, when you could lose jobs and family and reputation for coming out as an LGBT person, and seeing the gradual change in history over the decades to the wonderful successes we have today. So please follow me as we go into the exhibit. Guys, you guys are to keep up with him. Who you're, who's wheeling you? I'm wheeling you. He was a guy, and that's gonna be... Wow, I'm getting the real yeah. dog treatment. It is an honor to be wheeling you. Oh. Miss Kevin? I haven't walked in a just like Did we ever now. believe when we were walking down Christie Street I would be doing this with you? <laughs> Don't, make, don't test my belief. I hop out of the wheelchair and start running and doing laps. I'm don't just kidding. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Randy, look at all this. I know. I know. I'm, I'm so making... One of the things that I wanted to point out is that when we began this partnership in the National Constitution Center, Jeffrey Rosen, the president, said that we should frame this within the Equal Protection Clause. And here it is on the wall, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And so we framed this exhibit within that great idea that emerges from the Constitution that LGBT citizens, like all others, should be fully embraced by the Constitution and the arguments of the Constitution. You'll see how that evolves in the exhibit itself. I'm getting chills already, guys. I know you've been through this, John, but I have to yeah. Yeah. This is exciting for me. Yeah. Gather around, come on in. Come on, John, you're going to be up front here. This is your exhibit. It's about you. <laughs> well, you okay? Oh, I'm fine. One of the powerful pieces of this exhibit is we were able to get our hands on original footage of the demonstrations in Independence Hall, just two blocks from here, that took place every year. Uh, this footage was taken by Lily Vincennes, who oh, yeah. herself was an incredible uh, activist in the movement and fought for decades for our rights. Uh, but it's very moving, I think, to see the activists in front of Independence Hall. Uh, Frank Kameny, who you'll hear a little bit more as we walk through the exhibit, made rules. He felt it was really important that, uh, that the men and women who marched in front of Independence Hall looked like what, in, in his mind, he thought everyday citizens looked like. So the women were asked to wear dresses, the men's were, men were asked to wear uh, suits and ties, and so they presented an image of everyday citizens. And at the time, when people came out to look, and you, we actually have comments from the folks who were watching the demonstration, people were shocked because in 1965, homosexual people were so invisible that they couldn't even imagine what they looked like. They were viewed as criminals, they were viewed as deviants. And, the, and Kameny had this brilliant idea, which is to present uh, gay citizens like anyone else and to make sure that when he did that, he sent out the rules and these folks followed the rules and so they marched very politely, they looked like everyday citizens and the demonstrations in the early days, when we hear the people out in the audience responding, they said you know, how shocked they were to see how normal they looked. Uh, so they succeeded in, in getting that message across. And one thing that happens over the four years following, so the annual reminders happened in 65, 66, 67, uh, 68, and 69, that the final year demonstration the, the uh, gay liberation movement started to have its impact. So folks were coming down in jean jackets and starting to look like a more traditional hippie look coming to the demonstrations and disobeying the rules that Frank <laughs> sent. Uh, so that over those period of years, we see the demonstration evolving and in fact leading to those first gay rights marches in New York that followed Stonewall. So we're gonna head over this way. So one of the key points we wanted to mention was that the major fight that had to be done by the homophile movement was the depathologization of homosexuality. So taking it out of the realm of medicalization and disease and making the case that homosexuality wasn't a disease. Here we have some of the tools, in fact there were lobotomy tools, so lobotomies were performed on uh, gay and lesbian citizens at this time. Uh, it was also believed that you could cure homosexual people, and of course, you know, that's something we've had to fight in all the decades since then. But we thought it was really important to make this uh, the case that in the 50s, homosexuals were viewed in this way. And Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings and others had the genius recognition that they needed to confront this. And so, uh, in the early 1970s, they went in front of the American Psychiatric Association and made the case that homosexuality should never, no longer be viewed as a disease in the DSM, which was the manual that uh, uh, designated those as diseases. And they succeeded. And many of the gay media at the time made the joke that homosexuality was cured overnight uh, by the activism that they did in those days. I was there. You were there for that. <laughs> yeah, that's when we zapped the APA National Convention. Yeah, so that, Paul was there. How old were you at the time? Oh, God, I love the 30 maybe? Yeah, 30. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so all these courageous activists, again, continuing the work from the 60s in the 70s, and they had this really big success. 
So that nowadays, uh, mainstream thought no longer LGBT people viewed as diseased. And that's been really one of the most important successes in this battle.